Hello, and welcome back to Parlay. This prompt was written by Zesmeril. I hope you'll enjoy listening. It's about power creep and possibly finding a cure for it. Zesmeril begins, power creep. We all love it, and we all hate it. I have some words about that, but anyway, it seems whether the developer intends to do it or not, it seeps into long-running games. We've seen it in Warframe, with new weapons often getting stronger, or Warframes with increasingly strong ability synergies. In Genshin Impact, we've seen it in newer characters getting steadily stronger at base. The main issue, though, is that power creep is the result of developers trying to make new content that is on par or better than already existing content, forgetting that the existing content is experienced at a higher than base level. What ways could be used to combat this, though? Okay, a lot to break down. Um, you've started by trying to define what you feel is the problem with power creep, which is uh, brave. This is a subject that people have a lot of arguments about. Um, I think that's awesome. Uh, a lot of parlay propose a very difficult question like this uh, and don't reach for an answer as well, which is perfectly fine, but I think it's cool when you do. Um, because you did, I'm going to talk about that response first before giving my own, um, because I think it's good to respond to, it's cool that you suggested, like, where is the power creep coming from? Um, we'll go from there. Just briefly worth talking about the idea of power creep. The idea would be that all things being equal, the game's sort of baseline level of power um, is going up overall. The, the power of the player available options is trending upward. So for example, this might be that in, uh, sure, Warframe or something, uh, a Warframe designed today is going to be designed to impress players, you could think of it that way, that already have other Warframes built. And thus, there's a tendency to make the Warframe end up being more powerful overall in general, if you average out all their utility, once they're fully built out. Because, you know, you're not going to try them at first fully built out. In Genshin Impact, I actually don't know if I agree that there is that much power creep, um, but there certainly are a few cases of power creep where making a character that has utility when you already have characters that have similar utility often involves just creating an even more overpowered way of doing that thing. A simple example that comes to mind in Genshin Impact would be Nahida. Um, Genshin Impact has an, a somewhat recently added element, Dendro, which reacts with other elements a lot. It has a couple of like two-stage reactions. So often when you're reacting with Dendro, you want to apply a lot of a lot of elements, therefore applying a steady amount of Dendro with very little action from the player can allow you to pull off Dendro-related reactions more easily. It can be a little more demanding if you have to apply Dendro and Hydro to make a bloom, and then apply Pyro to make it blow up. That's maybe not as hard as just making a team with two elements, and you just put them all out there, and the reaction happens. And so, having a unit that inflicts Dendro on enemies in a way that makes it easy to do like several stages of reaction is very powerful. The problem, you might say, is that if units weren't able to do that well enough to begin with, well then the element wouldn't really fire a lot of the time. It would be very difficult for the element to be any good if the more basic units couldn't apply enough Dendro to sort of do the thing. You could kind of track the, the power creep a few different ways at this stage. Does that mean they made the Dendro reactions do more damage because the more basic ways to apply Dendro are less reliable? I think maybe so in Genshin Impact. Um, or maybe they knew they were going to release a more powerful way to apply Dendro. Nahida can just mark enemies, and every few seconds they just get Dendro I, if you do a reaction, but you will do a reaction every few seconds if you build a team to, to do these things. Um, so she's very hands-off, and it lasts for a long time. If there's lots of small enemies, you may need to remark really often, and then she doesn't give you much of a benefit, but neither is she that terrible in those situations. And against a few tankier enemies, she has absurdly long uptime on that effect for like one instant of combat. She just goes, bam, see you later in 30 seconds when those enemies will be dead. Uh, very, very strong. And so 
the previously made stronger dendro reactions are a little overpowered when you can apply dendro so effortlessly and with so much team support she gives everyone a lot of elemental mastery which makes their reactions even stronger um, this is a, a, a difficult problem to solve, as you point out. It seems like there was sort of a trap the moment that Dendro was developed, if you see what I mean. There was a sort of choice to make. Either things will feel underpowered, and then an overpowered option will be released, but that will be the right power level. And Dendro reactions aren't that strong, but we get a powerful enabler for them, so they end up being good or they're good to begin with, and therefore they will become overpowered if we inflict some, add someone who does it better. So as Zesmeril puts it, shall we try to diagnose the situation? You said that the main issue is that power creep is the result of developers trying to make new content that's on par with or better than already existing content, forgetting that the existing content is experienced at a higher than base level. I think what you mean is that when people are playing the game as it's going along, they're using leveled up things. So if you put something in the game that is meant to feel good to players who have fully progressed options, then that thing is gonna end up being overpowered once you progress it fully. This is tricky. Um, I think that I, for example, in Warframe, I would argue this doesn't happen that way exactly. That might not have been what you meant. Um, in Warframe, there really aren't any weapons that feel anything other than terrible at the highest levels of play the game suggests to you before they have mods on them. There aren't like new weapons released that feel super powerful, even completely unmodded, like so that the player will think that they're competitive with the existing options. Um, I would argue that doesn't happen in Warframe. Um, with Warframe abilities, with Warframe abilities, not with weapons, Maybe, actually. I could possibly be convinced um, there are some Warframe powers uh, lately where the Warframe is really quite good at doing something to enemies without much help. I'm thinking of maybe Lavos or Varuna's abilities to apply a lot of status effects to enemies, which is pretty good even if you haven't built into that that much. And Varuna is doing slash statuses as one of her things, which goes through armor. That can feel quite potent, even at relatively modest damage, because enemy armor gets so strong later on. So, I don't know. I'm not sure I would say those are overpowered, exactly. I don't know. It's funny, because I actually think Warframe and Genshin Impact are really good examples of mitigated power creep, where it's not that much of a problem. Another example in Genshin Impact that came out recently, which is really interesting, is Nuvolet. Nuvolet is a uh, giant hydro laser man, and he's got this interesting thing going on where the way his damage is designed, he scales with HP, so he doesn't benefit from attack buffs because his damage is based on his HP. There are a lot less ways to buff HP in Genshin Impact. So he does really high damage, but you know, it doesn't scale in the same way. You can't use a ton of damage enablers to make him way stronger. So even though he does preposterously high damage, if for some reason you ran him by himself, there's never ever any need to run him by himself except in co-op with four other players. Uh, so except outside of that very specific area, you could always have been buffing him with damage other ways. If you for some reason didn't do that, even though tons of the game is focused on how you can provide a character's elemental burst and then swap off of them and the on-field character still has that buff and you can build up a bunch of effects like in my example about dendro reactions and stuff even though the game is heavily based around doing that i mean lots of players don't do it so perhaps one might guess they made a character that is good really really overpowered if you play that way and then helped him feel balanced for people that, to be blunt, actually understand the game's ability to give you more damage by making it so he doesn't really get any better or much less better if you synergize with him. Indeed, I think in a fully built team of four characters, Nuvolet is perfectly balanced. Good, um, but not overpowered. Not necessarily perfectly balanced. I just mean balanced just fine. Um, but when played solo, which I would argue is pretty much irrelevant to the game's actual balance, but is how some players play, he feels really good. Thus, you get the best of both worlds. Players who aren't getting into it enough that hopefully they would be bothered by power creep will feel like the character that they went for is super OP, 
but he isn't actually though <laughs> uh, sort of weird thing i don't think this is actually that good um personally uh, i feel like it leads to the players that already maybe aren't engaging as critically with whether the game is sustainably putting out new characters it's going to encourage those players to say well everything is super power crept the game is going downhill quickly maybe a player just rolls nouvellette feels how powerful he is and gets the i think mistaken for the most part impression that you need to roll for the new characters to keep up with the content that's coming out you really don't in my humble experience that i don't think there really is much power creep in genshin impact um there isn't none it's we'll talk about that there's hardly ever none in most of these games um but i don't think that's really an issue but nouvellet may create the illusion that there is a power creep issue for players who aren't building into full synergized teams okay um so yeah i would um I would somewhat agree with Zesmeril's diagnosis, I think. Um, if I've understood you correctly, there's this feeling like the developer is responding to the player's perspective, which leads to a bias where characters become over a little bit more overpowered over time. Even Nouvellet, you could argue, well, if he's about balanced with other characters when you synergize with him, but when he's alone, he's wicked overpowered. I mean, what is that if not a little bit of power creep? I suppose. Um, I, even if I'm arguing it doesn't really affect higher levels of play, any part of the game that is really challenging, it, I don't think it makes that much of a difference. Um, I also don't know, you know, I haven't played a ton of Nouvellet. <laughs> Maybe he is massively power creeping the game. No one knows all builds and all that. Um, but let's try to diagnose a little bit. What, what do we, wh where do we attack the problem? If the developer is to cure the power creep, um, where are we combating it? I said that I think a way to break down the issue is that it's at a much earlier stage than just characters coming out later on. You can sort of see the issue from the beginnings of the game's mechanics. First of all, I would like to distinguish that I think this power creep that Zesmeril is describing is relatively specific to games where you progress your new game piece to a level that your other game pieces are already at. You have a level 90 character in Genshin Impact, you get Nouvellet, you level him up to level 90, then he's you know at the same level of gear and equipment and stats as your other characters, and you can kind of see if that resulted in an overall higher power level uh, at that point. Same thing in Warframe. You level up your Warframe or your weapon all the way, you put Forma on, you put mods on, and then you've got sort of the same support on it as your existing game options, then it is revealed whether you have resulted in a higher power level, sort of. Again, there's sort of a no one knows all builds problem here. Um, I think that the problem begins where the design is structured that way. Um, let me explain. I think that as the game goes on, you talked about how this is often in long running games, which I would agree is mostly true. The game is going to explore new design space, and players will have a tendency to either go for the new hotness, which can make it feel like the older things have fallen behind, or stay stuck in their ways, which can make it feel like the new things are just completely different and have kind of left them behind. Weirdly, that might feel like power creep, even though the player is not actually using the new thing. They might feel like they sort of need to get with the times, or they can't keep playing, even if perhaps they can, uh, if, if by definition the player is not using the new game piece, they do not know if they're losing out by not using it, right? Maybe it is way more powerful, they don't know because they're not using it, and I think people tend to assume that it is more powerful without checking, and that's understandable, though I think it is usually incorrect. I will play my cards here. I think that power creep is generally overblown, like a lot of claims that there's power creeping going on are misinformed. Like With all the information, the player would likely no longer believe that that was as much of an issue. Um, I've heard a lot of people in Warframe, for example, come back after a while and say, oh, I just can't keep playing because, you know, the new weapons in the next, in the recent years have power crept my older weapons. But that just is objectively not true. You can use builds that you had from four or five years ago, I do all the time, and do perfectly adequate damage. Uh, in many cases, you can't get meaningfully more damage by building some different way. 
but the player doesn't know that and they kind of pre-assume that well, the, surely the new things that came out must be really good, right? Because if they weren't, here we go. Why would you get them? If they're not better, why would you get them? Diagnosis number two. I think that power creep is partially being perceived more than it is present because players have an, a, a misconception about the premise of the game's design. The game is a game where you progress your items levels by leveling them up and putting more mods on them. It feels like a numbers game, but then the actual metagame ends up being that you just get more options, side grades, to the way you're already playing. I think this is true of, you used Warframe and Genshin Impact as an example, so I'll use those. Um, in Warframe, the new Warframes are, in my opinion, not really meaningfully that much stronger than older Warframes. Uh, the power level feels to me, around the same. But the game is framed mostly as if that wouldn't be expected to be the case. It looks like number goes up and you get more effectiveness. And that's not entirely untrue. The game does add in new mods that are just stronger versions of previous mods. Not that often, very seldom, but, but it has happened before. And I think that that makes it a little bit difficult to notice that perhaps these design additions are actually not making the game power crept. They're just additions. They're just new options. The game often displays itself as if it's a game where the new thing should, would, would be expected to be more powerful. But in my opinion, it actually often isn't. The game just hasn't done much work to flag that to the player, um, to make it obvious that this is a different option, not intended to be a more powerful option. Does that make sense? Um, you know Nuvalet. Uh, the existence of this character is a little confused. Again, I think what's going on is they're trying to make characters that feel noticeably more powerful to people who are just going to pay $2,000 to get the character on day one, and they want that new thing to feel powerful, without actually affecting the balance of the game when you achieve the levels of power that are possible building a full team. But as much as that seems kind of clever in a way, it is kind of clever in a way, it's at the same time rather confusing. You see what I mean? Um, and I think it's the same thing in Warframe, you know, making things scale so everything feels viable uh, while the game also progresses the player's overall power level on their account is a little bit of double dipping that may be harder for players to follow. You see here, you hear people all the time say things like, oh, well, the point is to level up your stuff and get stronger. If you fail at a fight in uh, Dark Souls or whatever, uh, you're meant to practice more, or you're meant to grind more, or you're meant to have a better build, or whatever. And there's an assumption there about what the game like is about. It's not about the thing that is an effective approach, it's about some philosophy the player has kind of locked onto at the game's onset. And I think fundamentally that Warframe and Genshin Impact's problem here could be diagnosed as a little bit of double dip a little bit of double speak, maybe you'd say. The games are not decidedly about progressing your power or sideways progression. They're kind of both, and so it's not easily possible for the player to correctly identify what the game's intent is. Therefore, without thoroughly investigating, which mo normal people do not have the time to do, you can't possibly know whether the game is power creeping itself or not. Um, therefore, as I, I was giving my example before, I think it becomes reasonable to assume that it just is power creeping itself. And it's important to note once again that I don't know it isn't. I don't know it isn't. Uh, maybe it's good to take a brief prelude, uh, a, a brief interlude, and talk about why this matters. Like, who cares? You know, it's the game's power creeping. What's the big deal? Well, I think for a lot of people, the concern is that uh, the game will leave them behind. So, for example, in Genshin Impact, it's commonly cited how uh, Spiral Abyss, which is kind of the game's challenging, uh, refreshes every so often, dungeon-type content. Well, the total effective health of enemies in Spiral Abyss's higher floors has gone up, sort of each update. And so people often use that as a way to demonstrate that the game has been power creeping. It's the power level is going up because that's been happening. And now I think this is actually pretty complicated. I mean, the player is getting more powerful. 
in ways that don't have to do specifically with individual units. I've played Genshin Impact and done dailies and leveled up units, spent my resin, which is how you, you know, get better gear and stuff. I haven't done the maximum amount of that you can do, but I've done it most days that Genshin Impact has been out. And my account has only just barely stopped progressing in power level. So to some extent, I would argue that since the game's release, the player is, on average, more powerful. It would only have, around now, become warranted to not make Spiral Abyss harder, to kind of match the power level of a lot of players. The game has more artifact sets available, and new and powerful reactions like Dendro. The player's power has been increasing over those few years, you see what I mean? Now, one problem there is that that doesn't increase every player's power. It only increases players' power if they find where those things make things stronger. Here's a simple example. Fischl has been in the game since release. She summons Oz, which is her crow uh, raven familiar, uh, raven, uh, and he's basically a lightning bolt turret. He fires electro bolts uh, off the field. Uh, Fischl doesn't need to do anything else except summon him and then use her burst to refresh them and, and go back and forth. Very limited field time and you get an electro turret. Very similar to Nahida's strength, Oz applies Electro so you can do reactions with it and do damage with extremely low field time. You hardly have to do anything and you get the full benefit. And he's got this powerful effect where when you do a reaction related to Electro, you get extra damage while he's on the field. That's very, very strong. All that stuff has been available since the game released. But only in the past few months did we get an artifact set that really makes Fischl do meaningfully more damage with the artifact set bonus, gear in Genshin Impact almost entirely lacked much of any damage bonus for Oz specifically, but we got one recently. It increases elemental skill damage, Oz is her elemental skill, by a lot, like 70%, uh, more if the character stays off the field, which you can easily do with Fischl. So you may have been running, you know, the most on average damage you could get before. I don't know, probably two piece for the Electro set, so that would be 15% Electro damage, uh, and then some Elemental Mastery, or uh, I don't know, maybe Attack. Um, this is a very large damage increase for a, for most people's Fischl's. If they copied that build to their Fischl, it would be a very big upgrade over whatever they had. Uh, they would expect napkin mathing it maybe a 30 plus percent damage increase on a character that's already really powerful and very heavily uses that damage. Um, but they might not actually get that artifact set. They might not know that. They might not, it might not occur to them to put that new artifact set on Fischl. That artifact set might come out and they might not think, well, what character is very elemental skill focused? I mean, another piece of confusion is that Fischl refreshes Oz's duration on the field with her burst, and that puts her elemental skill back on the field, but what you do is use her elemental burst half of the time. I would understand if a player didn't know that that still counted as her elemental skill when Oz is deployed that way. It does, but I, I would be understandable to be confused about that. You see what I mean? Just a little example to illustrate that even though the player's power level is increasing, that doesn't necessarily mean that every or most player's power levels are increasing. For me, the difficulty curve in Spiral Abyss has felt quite even, actually. So I wonder if maybe they, perhaps misguidedly, balance Spiral Abyss assuming the most involved players, you know what I mean? Um, I don't know if I'm the most involved player, but I, I would be in the upper percentile of that if the game offers you a tool to make an existing character stronger about 90% of the time or something. I probably have noticed that and I'm using it. And so any power the developers have given the player, I have most of it at my disposal over the years. And I, I do think I have nearly all of the game's premier damage engines on my account. Uh, if there's a powerful way that the developers have let the player do damage, I think I possess most of those currently. Um, the Raiden Shogun, all the attack damage buffers, Kazuha, almost all of the elemental mastery buffing, Nahida, um, Hu Tao, Zhongli recently. Um, anyway, so it works for me 
but is that or is that not power creep? Now, I again, I think the core problem here is arguably something about the premise that the game is a game where numbers go up, but you're also giving players kind of side grade options, which we've revealed another aspect of the problem, giving the player side grades actually doesn't result in their power not increasing. It becomes unknown if their power is increasing. You see the problem? Um, they either will or will not apply those side grades where they happen to be better for certain characters. Characters get a better fit for their artifacts or their weapon or their mods for a weapon, Warframe or whatever. But the player may or may not notice. The game's level of baseline power has ceased to be even remotely objective. In other words, therefore, it's Schrodinger's power creep. <laughs> uh, it's sort of unknown whether the, the the game is power creeped if you look for the power creep and isn't, you know, if you look for it to rise to the, your level of power. Um, I'm not saying games can't possibly be objectively power creeped, by the way. Um, I don't like disagree that there is power creep. Um, at all. I hope it doesn't come across that way. Just to say that I think the issue is much more complicated than the actual level of power creep in the game. I think it is significantly a communication or player perception issue. And there's not really a straightforward way to solve that as I've formulated it currently. It seems like if a game is set up this way, you kind of can't avoid the player having an unknown level of the power that is out there and therefore the player will have different perception and a different power level than the developer could possibly account for, making the game badly balanced for all but a few players, no matter what level of balance the game chooses. Hmm, weird. Now some of you might be thinking, well hold on, Nuvolet is genius. He makes it more even. If you know about the synergy available, he's perfectly average, and then g good, you know, but not overpowered or anything. But he's designed in a way that doesn't get much support, so he hits his ceiling of power, even for players that don't know about ways you could increase it further. You could put this a different way and say that Nuvolet is relatively obvious as a character. The things he's, the ways he's good are relatively obvious. There's an artifact set that came out with this region that is relatively obviously good for him. He plays with his HP going up and down, it gives you really good crit chance if your hp goes up and down it was intended for him players will say they'll put it on him and that is indeed very good go figure you know what i mean um yeah i don't know um i personally think this is a design flaw with this type of game uh that would that would be my quick and dirty answer to this question uh, we're kind of at a fork in the road i could spend a little bit more of the end of this parlay talking about ways to design games that avoid this issue sort of sidestep this issue or we could try to finagle a way to address it in these games to begin with. Um, yes, I could try to do both. We'll try, we'll try to do both. And maybe if one of them seems overwhelming or I actually don't have too much to say, then we'll move on. I'll, I'll try to do both. Okay, so addressing it in these games. The first thing that comes to mind is that if the player understood the game systems better, the difference in percep perception of power creep would be smaller. So in other words, if players understood uh, reactions in Genshin Impact, for example, better, then the average player's power level would be closer together. Players would have less of a difference in how enfranchised to the game's available power they were. Genshin Impact doesn't do an amazing job of making this clear. There is a dungeon early on that has all these little tutorials for reactions, but the idea that Almost all of the game's damage hinges on elemental reactions, except for a few very corner case examples, isn't often as clear to people. And nearly all of the times that I've been asked or seen someone ask for advice on a build in Genshin Impact, they seemed to be ignorant of the very idea that reactions were most of the available ways to do damage. Uh, I've had a lot of players say, and this is no shame by the way, I'm saying it's the game's fault, just to be clear. Um, I've seen players say that they were kind of dumbstruck by the idea that you'd make a build that didn't use normal attacks, when normal attacks are often just the lowest value thing you can do in the game. Genshin Impact doesn't really communicate this, in my opinion, and so you could argue that part of the problem is that, the sort of existence of a gap between player understanding and the game's actual balance, one or the other of which may or may not be power creeping, is coming from the fact that the game isn't that well understood. 
And I would argue that Genshin Impact is a good example here because it's not actually very complicated. Like reactions just involve combining two elements. Uh, for the most part, it's fairly straightforward, uh, but the game doesn't do a whole lot to communicate that. I'm not sure what you would do. Maybe there could be some kind of aspect of uh, Spiral Abyss, let's say, that focuses on those specific reactions. Now, they kind of do something a little like this. There are these things in Spiral Abyss where every so often you get a buff for doing a different type of reaction or using a certain element. So Spiral Abyss is suggesting to the player that you could use this or that to get uh, an increase in power. It often favors the characters that were just released. Now again, I think there are two problems there. The first one is that it often favors the character that was just released. That system might be misunderstood as just being a buff for the people that spend money and not, not seen as a way to kind of add variety or introduce players to the idea that a reaction might be good. Second of all, if the player does think, oh, well, I should use this reaction because it's favored right now, well, they might think it's only good because it had the buff. Players are quite prone to not actually testing before they assume that a thing is the case. That was my original complaint, that power creep might be seen more than it is actually there. Um, and so if a player uses Burgeon, Bloom, and then Pyro to explode the Bloom, because Spiralibus has buffed the Burgeon reaction, a lot of players, my experience is most players, will not use Burgeon after that's changed away and something else is being buffed. They won't use that again afterward to check if it's like still good or still feels good. Um, I'm sure it works for some people, but I think it creates the misunderstanding that that is only specifically good in this one instance. And elemental reactions might be seen as more of a gimmick that changes up gameplay rather than nearly always how you can do the best damage possible with a given team of units. Um, I'm not sure what a great way to communicate this is. Um, I have said before that I kind of favor the approach where the game literally just says in the game, elemental reactions are one of the game's primary ways you can get more damage. Or for example, when you fail a domain in Genshin Impact, the game puts up these little sliders that say, oh, your characters are, you know, this close to being the level recommended for this domain. Your artifacts are this close to being the level we recommend for this domain. But those things don't matter as much as elemental reactions do. Maybe they should just say, here are some ways to increase your damage. One, level up your stuff. You can progress your artifacts or character levels or whatever. Two, build elemental reactions into your team. These are one of the primary ways you can do damage. They have various effects. Here's this dungeon that tells you the effects. Three, you could, you know, figure out what order you want to use your abilities in, etc. You could imagine it like that. In fact, I think this is pretty common in games that when you when you hit a fail state, the game kind of suggests ways you could do better and how you suggest the way the player could do better is I think very important. It's not it, I think Genshin Impact is doing it in a way that isn't really useful information. Like, uh, yeah, surprise, you can level your characters up more and they'll do more damage. Like, whoa, mind blown, Genshin Impact. <laughs> um, this might not be a bad time for the game to suggest that it could be effective to use a very general strategy for building a team. I think it also doesn't help that the game essentially never gives you like an example of a really good team. The game often gives you example teams. You get tutorial characters that you might assemble into a team. You'll bring Kaya, Lisa, and Amber, your three first starting characters, and L Lumine or Aether, your traveler, um, and they might become your sort of first team. But the, that team doesn't have a lot of cohesion. Okay, they're just your starting characters. When you get to try out a new character in Genshin Impact, you don't get a team that is built any way other than just using free units and the character featured. So the teams aren't necessarily like premier examples is I guess what I mean. I don't think that's such a bad idea. Finding a way to demonstrate to the player a way you think would be effective to play can be fun. It can just as easily lead to players only playing that way. I mean, the lifelong question is how do you get people to think in a more universal way? about the game if you think that's a fun way for players to play and the answer is i don't know i'm trying to figure that out that is a focus of my career <laughs> i don't know <laughs> um but i think that the a weird core of the problem is actually the player uh n not understanding the game not doing a lot to help the player understand where power in the game comes from 
that doesn't address games that actually have a lot of power creep, mind you. But it does mean that if the game is diligent about giving the player genuinely just various different options that are of a similar power level, then that, that way of playing where you try to help the player understand what is available, what's out there, help the player know more builds, though they cannot know all builds, if you avoid power creep, that will help the player not think it's there. But actually preventing power creep, I don't know, I guess I, I, I'm tempted to say I don't think it's that hard, which is where we're going to briefly get into engineering your game to not have power creep to begin with. Here's one example. You could have your game be structured in such a way where you can easily numerically define the level of something's power. For example, in Warframe, I think it's a lot easier to do this than it is in Genshin Impact. There aren't all that many combinations of effects in Warframe that do very variable and subjective damage. Generally, if you build a weapon with all of the mods that give you the most damage, and in the most different ways, that is the most damage the weapon can get. That is, you can kind of eliminate the no one knows all builds problem. You can relatively easily estimate about the maximum damage for the weapon. And then just use it against the tanky enemy and see how quickly it kills the enemy. It should be easy enough to then math out, well, if it's a way different time to kill than other weapons, maybe this is a little too strong. In the first place, because mods in Warframe just multiply a weapon's base stats, it's easy enough to just make sure those are similar to existing weapons. Uh, in theory, I would argue it is kind of easy to keep things relatively balanced in that way. There are still some problems. For example, if you're a player that doesn't understand the armor mechanics, going back to my point from before, then Varuna's slash attack with her fourth ability where she dives at enemies and does a slash status well that goes through armor and if you didn't already know that there's like five different ways to counter armor that would be disproportionately powerful feeling to you even if the developers math it out and determine that like it is pretty balanced all things considered because you the player do not know that there are other ways to counter armor and this one is easier bringing us to part two of engineering games around uh, not having power creep finding a way to address the idea that some ways of playing are easier than others. Um, for some players, it's quite distracting if one method is just as effective as another, but it's just less steps, or they perceive it as less steps. It feels like in inconceivable that there is a good reason why you would do something else. I think that this is actually possibly fairly easy to counter as well, um, but it's subjective what easy is, if you see what I mean. Is Varuna's slash thing easy because you hit one button to perform the attack and it locks onto the enemy, but it might give you this sort of lurching sensation, and if you don't have the energy, you can't do it, and you have to specifically target the enemy. And if you did an area of effect weapon, it would hit more targets at once. What is less steps, really, you could argue? Um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like one problem here that's coming up is that having the game be so focused on just success rather than fun, appears to be what is distracting the player to focus on, you know, what gains you this tiny little benefit. Uh, maybe it isn't as fun for the player to be distracted by that. It's hard to say. That's subjective. Um, but really, I think the nuclear option here is making a game that uh, only temporarily presents a powerful state. That is, a game that kind of resets. Roguelikes are maybe the most reductive and dismissive answer I could have given at the beginning of this parlay. Games which make you make a build, but which inherently reset that build. And so no matter how powerful the player gets, well, it's temporary. You could go even further. Maybe the player builds things up in their power level only to use them in a glorious blaze of destruction, which destroys that weapon, let's say. All of the weapons in the game are destructible, disposable. You can't reload your guns. You fire them out, they are empty, and you must build another. Now, this would cause an amount of build making that I think a lot of players would not find desirable, but I'm just saying that you certainly would avoid power creep because the player never acquires any level of power temporarily. You could therefore balance things to feel uh, very overpowered almost all the time, and inherently, you just can't use the same one all the time. You could design a game that way. 
Again, I think this is a question of whether uh, the player will be bothered by the need to find new things all the time, but Rogue likes streamline this by creating an experience that results in you having a build without you really needing to design or think up a build. You can play a lot of uh, Risk of Rain 2, and you will end up with a very big, involved, powerful build with various different qualities and attributes without having imagined or designed or come up with one. It will just kind of happen as you go about the game. I think this is why these games are so popular. In my opinion, there is a bit of a flaw here where those games aren't doing a whole lot with when you don't do that well in a run. Ideally, it would be interesting to have a run end early. It's harder early, maybe you would think. But I think a lot of these games are not very fun until you get to a sort of medium point in the run. Like, I think Risk of Rain 2 is maybe balance fairly well across different moments in the run, the beginning, the middle, and maybe toward the end of a lot of runs, are fairly balanced, but I don't think the beginning of a run is very fun. That's at least my opinion. Like, there's not... you can't do much, just generally. That would be my simplest way to explain it. It can feel a little slow to start. So I don't think that's an ideal solution. It uh, feels kind of like an eat-your-vegetables piece of design, where the player is meant to be patient and kind of wait out, uh, getting their, their reward of being powerful. Um, I don't know. Uh, but I do think that these games seem to have hit on a successful idea where the player isn't as fixated on every single thing they do being the perfect choice. They're kind of saved from that in some way. I don't know. Again, it's tricky because we spend a lot of time talking about people who really like making their own choices, and many of you and I, a lot of you listening, and certainly I, um, well, we've kind of gotten this concern out of our way on our own. I, as long as the game's power creep is under control enough that I can use other options, I've sort of decided for myself, or learned myself, just how futile, and how much less fun, for me anyway, it is to use something that is a little more powerful. I'm much more willing to take a little hit in effectiveness and use the thing I like, safe in the knowledge that if the game is at all well balanced, that must be viable, that will be viable. The game is either going to quickly become unplayable and despised by a lot of people, or it will be okay to take a small hit in effectiveness. I don't know. Um, this is an interesting one. If I if I were to do this parlay again, I might have considered giving my own examples of power creep in games, and I do have them in theory. Um, a game I would talk about were we to talk about this subject more would be Arknights. I think Arknights is an interesting example where it's tricky because the game is quite committed to giving every unit, many units, different niches which sounds like it would be really good to counter power creep. Units might have different overall power levels, but most of them have a thing that essentially only they do. There's a conceivable niche essentially only they hold. It does still have the problem of the player maybe not knowing that. But anyway, uh, and I guess the problem is that at the moment in Arknights, a lot of new characters are being added to the game, which are, in terms of raw total power, much higher power level than existing units. Getting them on your account has a much bigger impact on your account's overall power, arguably, than existing units did. But I wouldn't argue that they violated that rule. They still do things where there are there's plenty of reasons you wouldn't want that. They're the only game in town for the thing they're good at, like a lot of other units are. So there's still plenty of merit to using lots of other options, but their power level is still higher. It's kind of a weird issue. The game has kind of solved power creep in the sense that there are good reasons to use a variety of utility options. Utility is good enough that raw power is just less relevant. That's another response I could give to what you do about power creep. But then the weird thing that's happened in Arknights is that although they've kind of solved that issue, we're then seeing, perhaps because the game feels it's sort of solved for power creep, ludicrously powerful units, so strong that they almost feel like they break the solution that was already put in place. Were we to talk about this further, I think I would then move on to that example. I think the thing about Warframe and Genshin Impact is that they're great examples in that the community says there's a lot of power creep, but upon further inspection, I really don't agree. 
Um, I think it is very arguable that there isn't, and the underlying problem is player perception of power creep. I'm not saying that's that isn't an issue, or that you're wrong to have brought them up as an example. That's maybe the more common problem. But we could talk about a game where I would argue there is a sort of objective power creep, even though it maybe doesn't feel it's the opposite. It maybe doesn't feel like it's that power creepy, though plenty of players playing Arcanite say that it does. Um, but it sort of is in an objectifiable way. Um, yeah, this is a really interesting subject. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can view power creep and manage games to avoid it or address it in some way. Uh, this is kind of a specter that hangs over a lot of games. A way to think about it is that if the player is going to ruin their own fun, they often will. Uh, you need to be planning to save the player from themselves. It's not enough to just hope they will play in a fun way. You need to make it optimal to play in a fun way. If there's a way to play that is more effective but is less fun, the player will often choose the less fun way, the more effective way. And I personally think that you are not really doing a game design if you don't do something about that. All the way back to World of Warcraft, which added the rested system. You want to binge our game? Well, if you don't, we'll reward you by giving you double experience for up to a whole level or two if you take a break for a little while. If you play the game at a more manageable pace, we'll reward you by giving you much more efficient leveling. It's better for you. It's the most effective way to level to play a reasonable amount at a time instead of all at once as fast as you can. Well, of course, if you want to get to the highest level absolutely as fast as possible and you have the time, you'll argue that it's more efficient to do it that way, I suppose. But you get the point. The game at least made an effort to balance out that effect, which certainly worked for me when I was younger. I didn't feel like I was missing out with my friends who would just play all day, sick at home from school, because when I got back, I leveled up twice as fast and caught up pretty quickly. Uh, not so bad. Anyway, I hope this was an interesting way to approach the subject. Uh, thanks for the examples, too. Again, while it's a type of power creep, and my opinion is that there actually isn't that much power creep in this situation, uh, I do think these are excellent examples. It was extremely easy to use those. And the idea that you gave your own diagnosis of where the power creep is coming from, also really useful. Uh, thank you for the great examples.